Welcome to the final part of Series 21, everyone. We're back with Daniel and Patrick to discuss the process of character creation in Ross Rifles, and also for a little while to gush about how adorable Antonio is. Ross Rifles is still on Kickstarter and has met a few stretch goals. You can find a link to the project in our show notes. A reminder that Ryan and I will be at a catacon in Dayton, Ohio, November 8th through the 10th. We also have a panel that Sunday at 10 a.m. We would love to see you there if you're going to be at the convention. I think, honestly, that's about all we have for announcements this time, as weird as that seems. So, here's the episode. Welcome back to our discussion episode, everyone. Last time we created characters for Ross Rifles. This this episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Patrick Keenan and Daniel Kwan, designers of this very game. And it is currently on Kickstarter. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves again for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the characters you made in the last episode? Uh, yeah, so thanks for having us again. Um, I'm Patrick Keenan. I'm the uh, writer and publishing coordinator at Dundas West Games. I'm one of the authors on Ross Rifles. Um, and the character I created last episode was Thomas Vivian Keenan, based off of my great-grandfather. He is the Scrounger playbook. Um, his trader calling before the war was an adding machine mechanic. He's just arrived at the Western Front. And, yeah. Nice. Uh, and I'm Daniel Kwan. I am a writer and the marketing coordinator at Dundas West Games. The character that I made uh, last episode is Kenji Nakamura. Kenji is a scout. Kenji has like a notorious reputation in the trenches for being a... <laughs> Can you say that with a straight face? As, has a notorious reputation in the trenches for being a, a skilled killer because of the marks on his rifle. And everybody thinks that these marks are for all the lives he's taken. But really, <laughs> they're for all the times that he's gone out into no man's land and made it back without any danger. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Kenji has right. a puppy named Antonio. Oh, Antonio, the most important character of this series. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, do you want to tell everyone about your character? Yeah, so I made uh, Frederick Thomas Bolter, uh, without the E in Bolter. Uh, well, the first one, at least. Um, they used to be a bridge builder uh, before they, they joined the war effort. Uh, they designed and uh, helped get bridges built. And uh, they are the creative. So they, they like to do drafting and drawing on the front lines and use that creativity to to help their their people get home safely. I, uh, what about yourself, Amelia? Oh, go ahead. Um, I made Algernon Gregory. I used um, the replacement playbook. Um, so Algernon is new here, uh, is replacing someone who was previously promoted. Um, he is, you know, not super sure of himself, but just like doing his best um, and trying to prove that he knows what's going on, even though um, he really doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> we really made up a big group of talented individuals. Yeah. Super competent. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's go ahead then and dive into a segment that we are calling a D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. But first, we like to talk to our guests about how they got started in RPGs in the first place. Oh, man. Do you want to go for the old me? I'm older or are you the younger person? Well, if you go first, then you can lead into, you know, me because yeah, you really they're related. brought me into RPGs. Ooh. Oh, rip. Yeah. <laughs> 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 wow, Patrick. Yeah, no, it's true. So I have been playing Rpgs for ooh, this year will be my 20th year. This wow. is my ooh, 20th nice. year of playing RPGs. 
Uh, I actually started playing RPGs at the Royal Ontario Museum here in Canada. Uh, my mom signed my brother and I up for this Dungeons and Dragons camp that they had. I had no idea what D&D was. I thought I was actually going to, I say this every time, I thought I was actually going to get to make a sword and I was going to hit, my, my plans were to hit my brother. <laughs> um, uh, I thought we were going to like basically do boffer LARPing before I knew what a boffer LARP was. And uh, we ended up playing D&D. Uh, it was third edition at the time that I later dove into a D&D on my own. But we started playing 3rd edition D&D, and I kind of fell in love with it. I was a camper at the museum for four years. And then I ended up volunteering with and then working for the camp and then teaching it from 2011 until June of this year. Oh, wow. Uh, so I was I was working with the camp since 2005 and then kind of teaching at it from 2011 until 2019. And that's where I met Patrick. Yeah, so I was also a camper at the camp. Um, I, when you were teaching it, I don't think I was, actually. Maybe uh, for one summer. There was the, well, me and Rich, the, yeah. who you had, we overlapped. At okay. the same time, we alternated. So I started working um, for the ROM and volunteering at Dungeons & Dragons camp. And I started to work with Daniel and for Daniel, I guess, Yeah. Um, for, during all that time. And then now I've taken over teaching the Dungeons and Dragons program, but uh, it's really what got me into RPGs playing D and D, and we started to play other RPGs as well, and then we started to think about writing our own RPGs, and it's where we met our business partner Daniel, Daniel as, well. as well. Yeah. Mm. So, did you know what it what D and D was when you went into doing this camp thing, um, Patrick? I had an idea that we would be playing a game. I didn't really know what D and D entailed at this time, um, but I ended up loving it. I love role playing, so. It was a good choice. Nice. Very cool. That's such a cool story. I, starting at a museum. Like, I think more museums should maybe have D&D. Yeah. Yeah. Get in touch with Dundas Bus Games. So. <laughs> 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 so then could you tell us about your personal processes for uh, picking and creating a character in uh, any role-playing game? I, you, when you said that, I immediately had a thought of your character in Urban Shadows, the one who's just called to the leg, what's going on? <laughs> Are you aware? Yeah, I really like to play that kind of like, I'm confused. I don't know what's happening in the story. I, yeah. So what you're referencing when we played Urban Shadows, I was the aware, which is the playbook that is like just introduced to the supernatural. <laughs> and I kind of, my character didn't even really believe that the supernatural existed. <laughs> so I was like, oh, what's happening? How could there be vampires? I know ghosts are real but how could there be vampires <laughs> i almost picked that one i'm starting an urban shadows game in a couple weeks and i almost picked the aware too i was like i just want to be it's, like it's fun hmm, how yeah. did i end up here <laughs> I, I like to play the comedic foil of the group mm -hmm. especially when i do so it depends on how i'm playing if i'm playing with like a home group i i love to play like a kooky character or we like i like to min max but if i'm ever doing anything anything at a con like a live show uh, like that, the Gen Con live show we did with the Broadswords and mm -hmm. Adventure Zone. I always like to pay, play like a comedic character. Yeah. So I, I like to make things suboptimal almost every time. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask, because this is a PBTA game, um, how do you think that character creation in this game stacks up against other PBTA games that you've played or read through? Because um, they all have kind of had that similar like playbook style of like picking things off a list and building those bonds and that kind of stuff. And I'm interested to see how you think that this is unique or like what things you've taken from other PBTA games. Oh, no. So many of my friends designed PBTA games. <laughs> <laughs> so everything my friends did, I looked at that and said, I can do that better. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is how the community furthers itself. Um, to, be, to be honest, one of, one of the things like I really love about Ross Rivals and I think what makes this stand out is that Ross Rifles actually gets you to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not just like checking off boxes or talking. You, you are checking off boxes and you are talking to people about the bonds and sort of the narrative sort of tags that tie us all together. But the added layer with Ross Rifles is that like all of us did when we were making our characters is it gets you to actually do some research. Mm -hmm. Like our, our past two independent releases have all been about getting the players to do research. So when we did Zany Zoo, yeah. a big part of character creation is just, and you do it on cue cards, is just sitting there and looking up information about the animal you decided to pick. We basically oh, nice. made Madagascar the RPG. <laughs> <laughs> and the last game we played, one of 
our our graphic designer will wanted to be a great white shark because we were doing basically you know finding dory you know when dory's at that aquarium yeah. yes um with the sigourney weaver aquarium we were like escape <laughs> from that aquarium and one of the players was like i want to be a great white shark but I don't know anything about great white sharks, so I'm just going to be Jaws, and I'm just going to look up the <laughs> Wikipedia for Jaws, and I'm just going to figure out my attributes. Oh no! But, but for Ross rifles, you know, all four of us, we were just like looking up things on like our family, yeah, or looking up like our our own names in the you know the Canadian War records. Yeah, like every soldier has a, a unique story, and I think that's what Roth Rifles is really powerful at, is conveying. Um, every time you play, every time you create a different character, um, I've always found that I've never really had characters that felt similar i've always mm -hmm. kind of had a different sort of narrative in mind going in and i think that's the um ability to pick from any sort of these soldier stories is a really powerful tool yeah, in I think character the, creation the structure of the playbooks also lends itself to you know, you could be the scrounger like your character is a scrounger yeah but your story is not set on one kind of scrounger mm -hmm. which i like but yeah with with all of our all of our games are you know our current ones and our our future ones um it's all about getting the player to learn something new every session not just about themselves and the real life friendship with the people at their table but also about the content of the game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really loved the the historical looking up of stuff when we were creating characters here and and finding stuff that was kind of relatable uh, mm -hmm. even even nowadays yeah and, totally and putting that into the game and it is just uh, a really interesting and unique experience that uh, I don't think I've had in a, a RPG character creation before. And I like that it it takes something like, you know, World War 1 which obviously involved tons and tons and tons of people and really kind of like brings it down to a very individual level, like you are focused on who each of these soldiers are as people. And so, you know, like you brought up the point too that overall like you are not making big changes to this war like it's still happening but the story you're telling is on these like individual levels um mm -hmm. and i really like that because i think that's something that we don't get in a lot of those kinds of games that it's very focused on like outcomes and you know strategy and things like that and this is much more personal mm -hmm. absolutely uh so how did you decide what types of characters you wanted to have in this game um, I it changed. It changed, yeah, dramatically, <laughs> very, very dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, originally, we only had three playbooks, and we were like, "Okay, this is just going to be a rank." Yeah. So we had a sergeant, corporal, and a and a private. Mm -hmm. And so the idea would be at you know at the table, you would have like a sergeant, a corporal, and then extra privates, which mm -hmm. kind of made sense. But that didn't allow people to have like a set story in yeah. the playbooks. So what we've really gone with in this new, uh, these six playbooks um, is to tell a narrative story for each playbook. So each playbook tells a different story of a different type of soldier on the front. Yeah. And all inspired by, you know, actual people. So yeah. like the creative was inspired by like J.R.R. Tolkien who fought mm -hmm. in World War I. Mm -hmm. uh, the replacement is for basically any soldier who's kind of felt out of place or brought into a situation where they were completely unaware and had no context. Uh, the sergeant, and many of them, they're based on multiple people, but for me, the sergeant is based on uh, Masumi Mitsui, who is the most famous Japanese sergeant of the war. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I like to think that the playbooks, while well, they have this sort of narrative idea of where you they're, they're going to go, they give you enough space as a player to build on them in your own way as well, your own agency to determine what your character is going to be. Yeah, of course. No, definitely. Mm -hmm. Are there um, specific things that you felt that needed to be added as character options here, like things that you felt essential to make this the type of game that you wanted it to be? Bonds. Bonds for sure mm -hmm. had to be there. Um in terms of, uh, I think I think for me, bonds and the personal item. Yeah. Uh, the mm -hmm. personal item is obviously something you see in modern day soldiers and in the past. When we went to the Canadian War Museum to do some research, one of the things that the armorer, the curator showed us when we were looking at all the rifles was this, was this bracelet. And it kind of, it almost looks identical to a modern um, medical alert bracelet. Oh. Oh, interesting. And we were like, is what's that and he was like you know like you wouldn't have in your normal dog tag which in canada is a circle it's a disc mm -hmm. uh but 
people at the time were often getting blown up or they were getting torn apart by by large caliber bullets. So some soldiers, as like a gift from home, would often get an identity disc, like a like a dog tag bracelet, so that if they were to die and their torso was blown up, their wrist might survive, so that that could be taken and sent oh, home. Wow. And so for me, that was, and the curator said, that, you know, that that's a that's not standard issue. So we always thought, like, well, that has to be a personal item. A character mm-hmm. has to have the opp- opportunity to give them something new. And then the bonds just tie everyone together. Yeah, the bonds are really what makes you uh, section a group of soldiers on the front, like from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that personally I thought is uh, was important was actually when you choose the state of your uniform. Um, yeah. And that's because I think if you're coming into this with a very little knowledge of World War I um, and you see the different uniform options, it kind of represents that, you know, maybe... You, the soldiers aren't as well equipped as you might think. Um, you can really take a choice on whether you want to be someone who's not looked on positively by um, upper command if you have an ill-fitting uniform or, you know, it, it just gives you an opportunity to set that baseline for your character right at the beginning. Yeah. Awesome. The bracelet thing is really like, I don't know, I feel like that tells you so much about what was going on too that people felt like that that's a thing that i need and like the kind of state yeah. of mind people had to be in too on top of that that like yeah. that's really scary yeah mm-hmm. because the way he said it to us was they knew they were very likely going to go and just die mm-hmm. so wow. what they wanted to ensure was that they would die and be remembered for dying or at least have confirmation that they died people yeah, wanted yeah. to have you know resolution even in death Ugh. yeah and that like what they what you were already given like wasn't enough to do that too is just like that's like that's heartbreaking mm-hmm. it really is it really is yeah war's not fun no it's not no. War, war is in fact bad yeah <laughs> in fact in fact, in fact war is, is bad hot take war bad but i mean that's kind of what ross rifle shows you yeah 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 so uh what does the process of character creation tell us about the game it, we already kind of went over a lot of that with uh, the personal items and and uh, the bonds and whatnot. Yeah, I, I think it also kind of the process of character creation also shows how versatile the game is for its audience. Yeah, right. Like you know when you when you sent us the notes on you know about character creation cast and you know the pre recording info, mm-hmm. the first thing you put is we're a family friendly podcast. So when Patrick arrived, I told him, "Okay, hey, this has to be a family friendly episode." Um, character creation can be made as such. So all of our characters are pretty kooky. You know, they're they we we laughed a lot while making characters in a mm-hmm. pretty grim setting. Yeah, despite the the terrible setting of the game, you can you know choose to either keep um, the grounded reality of the darkness of the trenches, or you can you know look at it in a more lighthearted way, which I think mm-hmm. is important. Yeah, for having fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, what do you think is one of the biggest flaws of the character creation process in this game? And then on the other side of that, what is something that you are most proud of here? Mm, biggest flaws. I will say that when we first interviewed Grant Howitt, he told me it was that his game was too evocative. So. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Our game is too educational. <laughs> I mean, some people might even argue that our game is too Canadian. Um, yeah. I don't think the playbooks are Canadian at all. No. No. I, I think you can take the playbooks and insert them into any other, you know, You could be an American. You just have to change the yeah. guns. But it, if you are playing Ross Rifles the way that we've written it, you're kind of pigeonholed into playing a Canadian. Yeah. Or or, or a Brit. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe um, it's Canada's time. Maybe it is Canada's maybe time. Maybe America. Maybe we've had our turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you definitely have. <laughs> 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 um, I think biggest flaws in character creation. I think of one of the things that we talked about actually putting on the playbooks is like having art. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a lot of information on the playbooks, and mm-hmm. we really want to make sure that it goes well. Right now, with uh, the quick start that came out before the Kickstarter, uh, there are a couple of things that we wanted to add and will be added. Uh, so when the Kickstarter is funded at the end of the month, um, so on November fourth everyone's going to get an updated quick start. So it's going to have way more updated playbooks and everything. 
And I think one of the things that we needed to do was like little things like actually write valor, I, wit, and yeah. brawn underneath the attribute table, like squares. Um, eliminate text. So for instance, on the scrounger, it actually says that you can add 0011 to your attributes in that order. What mm. we could have done was just put those numbers in the bottom right hand corner in the you know, um, a translucent font so that people could see it. Mm-hmm. And then when they get to add one to any of those, they just write in the total number at the end. So not only does that eliminate a line of text, but it'll also make you know the attribute selection a lot clearer. Hmm. That's one thing that I've been thinking about a lot. That and wanting art on them. Yeah, the art is a big, I wish we had art. But yeah. Oh, well. So I like that we... you guys have put a lot of thought though into like what these look like and how easy they are to use. And you know, we talked before about the fonts that you picked and having the icons and things like that. It seems like you've put a lot of thought into how people are going to interact with these playbooks too, not just the mechanics of it and the flavor of it, but like how how it actually acts as somebody sits down to look at this. Because as somebody who is not good at reading large paragraphs of text and is mildly dyslexic, like these are things that are important to people like me. And I feel like you guys have done a really good job of taking those things into account. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like my my day job involves, you know, accessibility, inclusion, and education. Same with Patrick. So yeah. we both work in education. And so if we want this to be usable by, mm-hmm. you know, families educators because it would be so cool to see ross rifles in a school yeah mm-hmm. that's one of our big uh i think goals that we have yeah. in mind right and if we want that to happen that the materials have to you know, work alongside those values mm-hmm. so if we want this to be the most inclusive and accessible powered by the apocalypse game the dot not only does the system have to reflect that and the content but also the materials that the players will engage with yeah yeah like yeah, <laughs> yeah. So is there something here that you're particularly proud of aside from those like those kinds of details that you've added? For do you want to go? I have an answer. Uh, I have an answer too. So <laughs> okay, uh, for, um, go ahead, go ahead. I'm yeah. uh, what I personally like a lot about the characters that I I keep coming back to is actually the playbook moves. I think that um all of them are they fill a certain niche but you don't have to take any one of them to be effective in the game. And it really lets you play the character however you want to play it. Um, right. Like, you can pick up the playbook that you played last time you played Ross Rifles and just pick a different playbook move, and suddenly it's an entirely different experience. And I think that each of them is unique and uh, lends itself to replayability, which I think is good. I, th- I think for me, it's not even a mechanical thing. Like, I'm proud of the whole game, and I'm proud that I got to work with two of my really close friends on producing. Like, we started a company together. Yeah. Like, we never thought that this would happen. <laughs> and we started a company together. But I think what I'm most proud of is that through Ross Rifles, I get to, like, for me, represent the Chinese community and produce a game that allows people to tell the actual stories of the First World War. I mean, there were, like, over 600,000 Canadians who enlisted in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. And of those, like, several hundreds of thousands of people... There were like 4,000 indigenous peoples and Mm -hmm. like 2,000 black Canadians, 200 Japanese Canadians, and 300 Chinese Canadians. And you wouldn't even know those numbers or you wouldn't even know of those contributions. And I wouldn't have if if we hadn't actually started this project. And we get to, you know, also tell the world that. And we get to let people who might not feel like they are even allowed to engage with World War I material feel like themselves or represent their own communities in this narrative mm. without somebody being like, well, that's not historically accurate. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what yeah. I say to those people. Ugh. Yeah. I, I really like that, uh, that you changed that up because I was thinking like, like who was the standard, you know, front lines people back in world war one it's like, can we can we play beyond that? And I'm I'm really glad that you can. Yeah, we, our our whole thing was we wanted to, amongst everything that we said, undermine popular notions of what it meant to be Canadian. Yeah, in the First World War. Yeah. So, how have you changed the the PBTA system then uh, to tell the different stories that you can tell within Ross Rifles? Oh man, so. 
I think within the system, there's, I mean, the, the core of PPTA is the, for us, the dice system and the moves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Initially, one of the things we wanted to do was change the system by adding all these things to it. Like we talked about vigilance, how we added yeah. that and then removed it. We added morale and, and kept that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think one of the things that we've changed most is how you engage with the system and not the system itself. Mm-hmm. Right. We wanted you to tell these stories, um, you know, about this diverse group of soldiers. But we also PBTA games kind of lean very heavily towards the role play and narrative mm-hmm. and very far away from the combat. Right. So if you look at games like that, we love like the watch yep. or night witches that feature war, the, the drama and the narrative is very, very heavily in front of you. Mm -hmm. And the combat is almost second to that. But in Ross Rifles, we wanted to have an even balance of both because the combat was so essential to the experience of the First World War. So what we kind of made was a product that has an emphasis on both role-playing and combat that could lend itself well to not only that indie audience who's already really into PPTA, but also people who are coming from like D&D or Pathfinder. And that was something we were really cognizant of early on. Yeah, I also think if you're talking about mechanics, um, a major part of the World War One setting, the World War One experience is war neurosis, and I think adding the second harm track, the stress track, was a really good way to yeah. represent that. Yeah, the psychological the well. damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, that feels like one of the biggest things that kind of adds the, the flavor of the setting, because that is really important to that experience. I mean, everything yeah. everything about the system that we adapted, like that harm, the stress, mm-hmm. the attributes, the morale, yeah. the bonds... Are all and ground are all period accurate, so that's all reflective of what was being experienced in the First World War. Mm-hmm. And I, I really like uh, the stress track and how it it kind of forces you to work together to eliminate the stress. Yeah, together mm-hmm. because we wanted to use that to sort of force cooperation yeah. <laughs> between NPCs or yeah. PCs because it it gets really brutal as you get down there mechanically. And I'm like, yeah. that, that makes sense for that, that war. You know what's funny, though, about Ross Rifles? Initially, it was a super brutal game, like yeah. really brutal. But as we sort of began to change the rules, I actually haven't experienced a lot. Like, I haven't actually killed players while, while running Ross Rifles. I've only had two instances of player death, and they actually decided to let themselves get killed to save the others. It was always something dramatic. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it... it, it it gives you that feeling of urgency and danger, mm-hmm. and it kind of puts you there, but it's not designed to be super punishing. It's not yeah, like it doesn't Dark take Souls. away from the fun or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I don't like know. That. I always find that really, like, that balance between, like, figuring out mechanics to tell the kind of story that you want to be able to, like, take those rules and use them to push people in the direction of the kind of stories you want them to play out is, like, fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. That intersection between, like you know, like hard numbers and feelings is so cool to me. And I like, that's one of those things that I wish I personally understood better, like how to do, but it fascinates me. It took us two years to get this. Done. <laughs> right? yeah. well, that's, I mean, and that's what so much of playtesting is for, too, yeah. is just saying, yeah. like, okay, I what think, are people doing with these things? I think at this point, we've probably play tested it with easily over a thousand people. Yeah. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, we've done so much playtesting. <laughs> your face when you say this so much <laughs> well, when, well when we we were talking about like you know doing this podcast and then when i was talking to patrick when when i let him into my place we were like we're not going to play the game we're just going to create characters and we were both like oh. <laughs> I, I know i said the lack of consequences is wonderful yeah <laughs> i want to talk about our group um this is what we always call the fan fiction section of our podcast um how do you think that our current group works mechanically? Um, how would we do it in a typical session? Um, how do we see this this nonsense playing out for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, okay, so you have that question. You said, how would we fare well in a typical like session? I think we would fare very well the, because Patrick's giving me this look. <laughs> like all our characters would die. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but the idea is that Ross Rivals can be played your way. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if we want to create this like a very like it's it's like a, an episode of Blackadder. If we were creating these really comedic, kooky characters, mm-hmm. they can have a comedic, kooky adventure, still feel danger, mm-hmm. but still succeed. 
right? Yeah. If you want to make a group of serious killers and you want to be all tactical, you can do that. You can do that. Yeah. Right. So I, I think any group will fare well. It's just a matter of group cohesion and setting the tone and setting mm-hmm. the expectation on what you want. Yeah, it really yeah, feels which is a huge like part of. Go ahead. Yeah, it really feels like we're we're not going to be going on the front lines here and you know trying to charge the enemy, you know, guns a blazing, at all. I think our characters are all morally against that. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but we are going to find so many table legs out there. Like we're just going to be scrounging <laughs> for table legs. Yeah, <laughs> one of these tables. days we'll get a table. We like, can train Antonio to like sniff out table legs. Yeah. Right. And so we would. I mean, for a couple of sessions, we could do like episode one would be. You know, we spot the table, we go and we get it, but we only maybe get come out with the table leg. Yeah. And over the course of like a season, we we take the group through the war, like the second battle of Heap, <laughs> the Sum, Passchendaele, Bimmy Ridge. Getting re uh, sort of like re uh, assigned to different places in the trench, and we don't have a table. Yeah. We need to get a oh, new no. table. <laughs> or we stay in one spot and we're just never moving, and our dugout just gets more and more lavish. And by the end of the war, we've progressed so far into France that we've been left behind in our luxury dugout. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like it can I like go. the idea that like the story is told over time, and you can tell that time has passed by like the different parts that we've added to this table. So like over time, it has like the, each leg is different now by the end, and like the top of it is different, and like that's how you can tell that time has passed. It's like okay. the sisterhood of the traveling pants, except it's the traveling table. <laughs> yep. Yes, the table with us, <laughs> and then the the podcast art would be like. You know the the flag where they're putting the flag up at Iwo Jima, except yeah. it's the four characters carrying a table <laughs> across no man's, across no man's yes. land, yes, <laughs> over oh, a gosh. bridge. Yeah. yeah, it has to be yes. over a bridge. Oh. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh. with, Ant- Antonio with Antonio tagging Antonio. along behind us. Yep. Yeah, or Antonio's on top of the table yeah, as we're all right. carrying. Oh. Each of us have a leg of the table. Oh yeah. Oh, this is very good. This right. is very Perfect. good. Amazing. <laughs> If somebody's uh, listening to this and wants to do art of that, please. Yes. <laughs> please. <laughs> or if you want to start your own podcast, we can send you our character sheets. Yeah. Yeah. We, I'm very excited to find out how this goes. <laughs> the table crew. Yep. This is amazing. I, I, I love our group and I love how quirky it is, but like we, we could actually be useful in the war effort as well, you know, with mm-hmm. scouting and with, uh, scrounging together of materials and like practical creative solutions on the front lines and all that sort of stuff. Definitely. So well, I also feel like the setting of like being in this trench together and, you know, like in this, like having to go into no man's land and all that kind of stuff allows for you to tell like really emotional stories too, which mm-hmm. I, those are the kinds of stories that I like to tell is like those like really deep personal emotional yeah. kinds of stories too. And I feel like there's a lot of room for that as silly as we've made it with this dog and these tables and all that kind of stuff. Like I feel like there's the potential that you can tell some like really deep emotionally grounded yeah. stories too. A hundred percent. What if the, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Like what? What? Like what if? Um. Like if Kenji's really gone for like too long, and we have to figure out what that is, and you know, like there's all kinds of potential for mm-hmm. things to go just slightly wrong and feel like because you have those deep personal connections to like really worry about the people around you too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And don't run out of dog food either. Oh yeah, man. How, how are we going to feed the dog? <laughs> <It's>, you know. <laughs> We're like barely making it ourselves, and we got to worry about Antonio. Got to got to try to train it so it can't doesn't bark all the time. Oh, yeah, gosh. yeah, revealing our position, <laughs> revealing our position, <laughs> or maybe Antonio is constantly revealing our position, and we have to make a difficult choice. Oh my oh, gosh! No. Now, I'm not saying kill Antonio. I'm saying send Antonio <laughs> to the reserves. Wow, oh. Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's time Antonio gets promoted to an officer position. <laughs> See that that's the kind of drama that would happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't attacking Patrick for implying that I wanted to kill Antonio. I was attacking Thomas Vivian Keaton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was it's it, attacking your great grandfather. Oh, so <laughs> still a still a still a still a burn on you. <laughs> Take that, Patrick. Generational burn. Wow. <laughs> that's a shirt. That's a shirt. That's the, a good shirt. The that's worst good... kind of burn. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get into our advancement discussion then and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. So in this segment, we'd like to cover how character advancement and growth happens in this system. Uh, So let's first talk about how characters can change as people 
within the narrative of the game. How does that work out generally? Oh, I mean, when in, in Ross Rifles, I, people, uh, depending, again, depending on the tone, like for, for our, if we're just looking at our group, the one of the things that I definitely see happening if we were to play out this game is that our characters would be less happy go lucky mm-hmm. and far more hardened. Mm-hmm. Like, I think the story of, you know, you know, Algernon, Thomas, Frederick, and Kenji is that of three people who don't really belong in the army eventually proving themselves at the expense of part of their humanity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they become these hardened soldiers uh, by the end of the war. And I'd be super interested to see what happens to them. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, also, if I find that like a typical playthrough of Ross rifles, even if you start off as characters who, uh, you, you know, you don't really get along, right? The what happens over the course of the narrative of the game really makes you care about the other PCs, even if you know at the beginning you're like, oh, I just care about myself. I only want to get promoted or something. Yeah. Um, just because of the the horror of the setting and uh, the fact that you need to rely on each other so much to survive. Yeah. Yeah, that whole stress, that whole stress track, uh, and trying to keep everybody, uh, you know, less stressed and relaxed as much as possible, is it would be almost impossible to do that solo, or oh, to, be, yeah, to be on your own uh, apart from the group. So you're almost forced to work together the whole time, and I, I love that. Oh yeah, a solo game of Frost Rifles fe- can feel very different. I'm actually for another podcast. I'm doing um party of one podcast. Yeah. Oh yeah. And we're gonna do a one on one Ross rifles. Oh wow. Oh, that's gonna be so cool. And my plan is to actually kind of start it in the midst of a battle, and the character is actually gonna be stuck in the middle of no man's land in a crater, alongside a German soldier who's also stuck there. Oh wow. Oh cool. Almost like a life of pie sort of thing. Yeah. 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 But it's not a tiger, it's a German person. And it's not a boat, it's a crater. And it's not an ocean, it's no man's land. Oh, wow. I think that this has, the way that this feels, just like with our little group at least, um, is that it's very much like the whole game is kind of a bottle episode, right? Like you have these people like in this broader thing that is happening, but you're telling this very like tight-knit story of mm-hmm. like this one situation with these this one group of people. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for people to really change just because like because of the people that you're around too like we're all affected by the people that we spend time with too and so regardless of the circumstances themselves just being in a tight-knit group with the same people for any period of time is bound to change you too oh yeah for sure Mm -hmm. so let's talk a little bit about advancement um in this game how do characters level up in ross rifles and what kind of perks do you get when that kind of thing happens yeah, so we, we we touched on this in a little bit in the previous episode. There are like two ways that you can get experience in Ross Rifles. Uh, the first one is through your bonds. So when you resolve a bond or a bond changes. So for instance, um, during the last trench raid, I saved a puppy named Antonio. They now trust me with their life. If something about that bond changes... If Antonio no longer trusts me with their life, that puppy no... Oh, my God. That makes me sad. <laughs> I don't know why I picked this example. I'm just, okay. I'm going to pick a different one because that one makes, makes me too sad. Uh, <laughs> right. The puppy eyes. Um, Frederick and I often butt heads when strategizing. Yeah. So, so if Frederick and I are constantly butting heads when strategizing, if during our, our number of sessions or our single session, we kind of realize that we need each other to come up with the optimal strategy. That bond is changed, and we get to mark XP. Hmm. Yeah. And the second way is... The second way is by completing objectives um, through combat or uh, just going over to no man's land, however you want to do it. But basically, uh, command would give you an objective, and you have to complete it. And so we really set that up in a way that you can advance your character through either role-playing or through... Um, you know, going with the combat side of things because we wanted to blend those two aspects together in the game. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when you do advance, it takes four experience points to advance. Um, You would either add one to your attribute, one of your attributes um, to a maximum of three, or you'd be able to pick another playbook move. Yep. Interesting. So is that relatively open-ended then? Just like every four experience, just do one of these things? Yep. Yep. Very nice. I like how easy that is. 
Yeah. I really hate when I get you like you sit down for a session and you're like, oh no, I didn't spend my experience from last time. Hold on, let's take thirty minutes while I figure out what I'm going to do with this and how many points things cost. I really like games that allow you to role play and also level up at the same time. Yeah, where that's built yes. in. Like you could do that in D and D through milestones and all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but if D and D is hard coded for you to level up through encounters. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, but I like games that that let you level up. Like I think one of the best ones for that is, and I say it every single time, Coriolis. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in Coriolis, you you gain experience by participating in being a part of drama in role playing, and you level up at your own rate, just like in Ross Rifles. Yeah, I like it when it's it's rewarded like narratively and it feels narratively impactful like this is a thing that you know like my character has been through something and now they are a better person for it or a worse person i suppose depending on what happens and how it happens um but like that experience points should be related to experience like Mm -hmm. a thing Mm -hmm. that you have gone through yeah yeah exactly that's very cool is there anything else that you feel like people should know about this game that we have not covered yet? Um, I can't. No, think of Ross anything. Rifles is going to be on Kickstarter from October fourth to November fourth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so we it. Should be, uh, <laughs> we should be right in the middle of that uh, by the time this releases. So, yeah, absolutely. Go back. So it. go <laughs> go go get this game. It's a very good game. <laughs> <laughs> and n- there are no no sad things happen to puppies at all ever. <laughs> No, no, never. No. And you, you know what? One of the things that we put in the game is we did put safety tools. Yeah. We, we, we wrote oh, that into the game. Uh, there is a section on, you know, we actually put sections on shell shock and war neuroses mm-hmm. just so that people had the proper context. Mm-hmm. So when they're reading through the game, they're like, okay, this is what it actually was. This is how I can be respectful. Uh, we put a whole set, a whole history of the war itself, but also on the history of the people who fought in the war. Yep. So Ross Rifles is, if you're looking at the quick start, if you've downloaded it already on DriveThruRPG or from our website, dundaswestgames.com, uh, you might you might see it enough mechanically to play, but our book will feature so much more. We're going to mm-hmm. put like battles in there. Yep. Um, all the major battles of the Canadians. We looked um, at the weather. Patrick and I looked yeah. at the weather. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, like a bunch of GM tools to help the GM run the game, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. We have Very some cool. neat things in our in our stretch goals. Uh, lined up we're gonna one of our strict goals is a new uh playbook Mm -hmm. we have a whole new supplement on and i think this particular group here will really like it on npcs but it will also feature mascots like animal mascots yes (laughs) yeah yeah it's some cool stuff yeah yeah that's awesome i'm excited Mm -hmm. it's gonna be good well, Daniel and Patrick, thank you so much for joining us and talking about Ross Rifles. Can you remind everyone where they can find you, um, where they can find this game, and what sorts of things you're working on? Um, so you can find me uh, on Twitter. I'm at Keenan underscore Patrick, same as on Instagram. Um, and you can email me, Patrick, at Um You can find Ross Rifles, which is it will be currently on Kickstarter, um, and on our website, DundasWestGames.com. Yep. Uh, You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Daniel H. Kwan. You can learn more about me at uh, DanielHKwan.com. For my email, it's uh, Daniel K. It's off brand. Daniel K (laughs) at DundasWestGames.com. And what am I working on right now? I am the the co-host of the Asians Represent podcast. We release three episodes a month. We're actually, if you want to hear Ross Rivals in action, we've released a two episode sort of mini series with an all Asian cast in the nice. First World War. Uh, I'm doing some writing some stuff for Wizards of the Coast, for Darker Hue Studios, and I work as like a sensitivity reader and developmental editor. Very nice. Yeah. Well, thank you again for sitting down to do this with us. And thank you to everybody tuning in. Uh, definitely check out Ross Rifle's Kickstarter if you have not already. Uh, the link will be in the show notes. And we will see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. 
Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Adventure. Adventure is an actual play podcast that focuses on the fun of fan fiction and is set in your favorite fictional universes. Join host Pranks Paul as he takes a variety of guests through self-contained stories featuring Harry Potter, Pokemon, Animorphs, and other favorites. The game... Brian, what does this say? <laughs> oh, we'll be covering sorry that was yeah <laughs> I was like I don't know what that's let's just take it for the top <laughs> that's you okay thank you <laughs> have fun editing out my allergies later I know that's gonna be so fun <laughs>